And so, Lord Jesus, um, we lay this down, the sanctuary down, and I lay impact stories down, because breaths, right, they do stress me out. Um, because, uh, Lord, it's us, it's us that is um, to speak your word, and we do speak your word, and we do this together, and I just thank you so much for the, the sanctuary, Lord God. And then I thank you for the wonderful thing that you said to my wife this week when she came up the stairs and she said, I was praying for you, and Jesus told me to tell you, remember Balaam's ass. <laughs> that is so encouraging to me, God, because I feel like an ass. And yet you speak through asses to religious people, prophets, and redirect things and are glorified. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would speak uh, this morning and uh, that I and we would speak this morning because we see you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So this is uh, the fourth uh, sermon in a series that we've been doing on the, the gospel, New Ancient Foundations, the gospel that uh, Jesus, or God is salvation, the name Jesus. Number one was hell, the imaginary elephant in the room. Number two, creation. Did God lose control of time? No. Number three, anthropology. What is an atom and how do you make one? That's what we talked about last week. And now this one, the fall, the doctrine of original ignorance. And so if you struggle with this message, it's important that you've kind of uh, learned the the first uh, three up there. When I was uh, going through the, pro and you can take that down now, uh, Sasha, thanks. When I was going through the ordination process in the 1980s, early 1980s, uh, the denomination would often require what they call clinical pastoral experience, uh, CPE. And I haven't shared this with many, but for a while I worked in a facility with some folks that were just a tremendous challenge. Jacob was entirely self-centered. I think he seriously thought that he was like the only person in the world. He would, uh, he would just suck the life out of me, try to suck the life out of me. Many times I'd walk into his room and find him just absolutely covered in filth. It was wretched. Betty was terribly self-centered too, and also prone to, to rage, fits of rage. She would bang her head against the wall, against doorknobs if she didn't get her way. Several times, just to protect her and myself and those around her, I literally tackled her and held her down until she passed out. Once having brought her into my home, she actually bit Susan so hard that she bled. And at that, I thought, I'm done enough. She just needs to be put away. There are certain people that are so wretched, so entirely and totally depraved that there's just no hope for them. And you know what I mean. You have names, maybe a list in, in, your, in your mind. Well, I found this old picture of Jacob and Betty that's Jonathan Jacob Hyatt there at the top of the picture. <laughs> and that's Elizabeth Betty Ann Hyatt there at the bottom of the, of the picture. The facility is actually in my house. And caring for them really was the very best clinical pastoral experience that I have ever had. And they really were incredibly self-centered when I first met them. You know, psychologists say that infants really aren't even aware that you exist. They consider you to be like an extension of themselves. Jonathan really did try to suck the life out of me. I remember the, week, the first week I brought him home, and I made the mistake of holding him in my arms without a shirt on. And he just latched on, <laughs> began to suck. And it, it was a bad experience for everyone, everyone involved. <laughs> And being the first, potty training was really something of a, of a challenge for John. It got pretty wretched at times. Elizabeth would seriously, and I don't, is Elizabeth here? I didn't see her. She said she, she might be downstairs. But she, she, would, um, she would just bang her head on doorknobs when she would get angry. 
More than once, I literally did have to hold her down until she just passed out from exhaustion. Once, when Susan bent over to fix the vacuum, having just learned how to walk, it's like she saw her chance and she ran up and she just sunk her teeth into the world's greatest bottom, in my opinion, leaving bloody teeth marks. I mean, that is totally depraved. Now, I know that you may be thinking, okay, yeah, funny. But Peter, that's obviously and totally different. They didn't know any better. They were not grown up. You see, that's my point. Maybe you've never, ever actually met a a grown up. Jesus said, you must become like little children to enter the kingdom. Do you suppose that he said that because we're all actually grown up? I mean, knowing good and evil and entirely capable of choosing the good and freedom And so now he is asking us to choose ignorance and irresponsibility. Is that what he meant by you must become like little children? Or do you suppose he said that because we actually are little children who are just constantly, desperately trying to be grown up? I love this picture because technically they have both sinned. And I caught them in the act. (laughs) And they both sinned because they both wanted to be like me and Susan. I think that's my, I can't see everything very well on this, on the screen, but I think that's my electric razor there uh, at John's left knee. Elizabeth is uh, trying to apply makeup, just like, like mommy, but she's struggling. Uh, but they both have been told, do not play with mommy's makeup bag. But look at Elizabeth, she doesn't know it. In other words, she didn't comprehend the law. Susan would explain it, and Elizabeth would just look at her and giggle and do whatever she pleased. Because you see, she was still in the land of delight. Eden means delight. She's still living in the land of Eden. But Jonathan, I don't know if you can see that, he has a different look. It's called shame. Do you see it? Jonathan is aware that he has taken forbidden fruit. And now he has the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know what happens to me when I see that look in my son? Deep in my gut, something begins to burn for him. Once at Walmart, enamored with some toy car he saw on the shelf, he waited too long and he had an accident. The wretched kind. Number two, I said something like, John, ugh, I told you not to, to wait, and, and I'll never forget. He looked up at me with those eyes, and with those eyes locked on my eyes, he said, but you're still proud of me, right, Daddy? And that fire just burned like it never, ever had before, burned so bright. My heart just melted, and I said, yes, yes, yes. And I, and I wanted to say, I would gladly give away all I have, John, and descend into hell if that's where you find yourself one day, just to be with you. Because don't you understand? You're my delight. You are my Garden of Eden. Years later, when each of them were uh, older, there were times when neither of them would look me in the eye. And I didn't know where to find them. And I would think, where are you? What have you done with, with that son of mine, that person I know? But then with each of my four children, because we've got four, there were also times when they came to me broken and they told me where they had been. It was sometimes quite painful, and yet those moments are seriously now the most treasured moments of my life. Isn't that something? In those moments, I'd want to just shout to the universe, time to party, for this my son of, this son of mine was lost, and now he's fine. This daughter of mine was dead, and now she's alive. Kill that fatted calf, and let's celebrate. And where had they been lost? Well, that's not for me to say. 
except to say that they had each been lost in the very same place that I find myself lost, over and over and over and over again. They were lost in, in one of these. I love these um, paintings by the Polish artist Igor Morsky. This is what we preached about last time. You have a self that God has made, trapped in a self that you think that you have made or that you should make, a false self, an ego. At the time I snapped that photo of Elizabeth in the bathroom, she didn't really have much knowledge of good and evil at all, uh, knowledge of I am not and I am. But in a few years, she had gained that knowledge, decked herself out in fig leaves and constructed one of these, a fortress and a prison for her true self. But the time I took this photo, she did not yet know how to do that. I mean, just look at her. She's eating the makeup. She doesn't even know how to apply it. She's eating it like fruit from a tree. But you can see it in John's eyes, can't you? He knows the commandment. And so he's thinking two things at once. Number one, how can I hide from daddy? And number two, how can I impress daddy with who I am? And so who it is that John actually is gets hidden in the self he constructs to impress me and those around him. And so he's trapped and he feels alone. He gets trapped in the self he thinks he should be, but can't actually make himself become. The true self trapped in the false self because he has knowledge of the good. He, he, he knows the good, but he doesn't yet know the good as he ought to know the good. Or will know the good. Because you see, the good is far more than information about a makeup bag. And now I should mention I don't yet know the good as I ought to know the good. And so I also have one of these. I'm no perfect father. And I know that. And so I hide from God. It's important that at some point my children see that, what's, that, that, that what's true of them is also true of me. Jesus said, God alone is good. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus had no sin. And yet he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Somehow he dressed himself with us. He was born naked. We wrapped him in swaddling clothes, placed him in a, a manger, and, and he was crucified naked on a tree in a garden where he cried out, Father, forgive them, because they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. They know not what they do. And then he delivered up his spirit, the spirit that has descended into us. He once says, said, no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It's, it's his choice. No one knows the Father except him. How did Jesus know the Father? I mean, he did seem kind of childlike, right? I could fall asleep on a boat in a storm. He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. You know, that's how a, a little child navigates this world. It's called faith. And faith means trust. So Jesus entrusted himself to God, our Father, in the midst of the most horrific sufferings. He was childlike, but not childish. And kind of Paul kind of makes a big deal out of this. I, I, you know, I found my children to be most childish when they were just convinced that they were already grown up. Knew everything and did not need me. And, and I suppose that's when I'm most childish too. Most childish and least childlike. Maybe it was children trying to be grown up that took the life of Jesus on the tree when he cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They, they don't know, or at least they do not know as they ought to know. The good. 
they don't know. We actually had this problem with, uh, we had two more. We had this problem with each of our four children. And so years ago, we had them all tested. And the doctors said, we're sorry, but this is genetic. <laughs> they, they inherited this condition, and it's not their fault. They were just born stupid. And by that, we mean that uh, they just, they were just born not knowing stuff. They didn't know good and, and evil. They, they're born not knowing good and evil. And we predict this is going to be a problem down the line. You just need to know. And we didn't actually have them tested. I mean, how weird if they had been born knowing everything and needing nothing. They'd have no need for me and never come to know me as I am. We didn't have them uh, tested. We actually knew that they'd probably come out that way. Um, and even on the worst of days, we never contemplated endless conscious torment because in them we found something that we had forgotten about ourselves and that we had forgotten about the people that were around us, and that is that every person is the breath of God in a bag of dust. And every person is born to trust. I mean, they, they come out as just these little trusting things. Everything is born to trust, and yet no person is born knowing good from evil. That is, they don't know whom to trust. They're all born ignorant. All 8.2 billion, they don't know, and even then, they don't know as they ought to know. People ask, what's wrong with this world? And then they blame Adam and cite the doctrine of original sin. And I'm just thinking maybe we should start citing the doctrine of original ignorance. And saying stuff like, please forgive them. They really don't know what they're doing. Sometime around the start of the fifth century, Augustine, of, or Augustine, you say it both ways, of, of Hippo, North Africa, Roman Empire, he termed the, he coined the term original sin. He didn't read Greek, and he formulated the doctrine based on a mistranslation of Romans 5 and a rather complicated relationship with his own father and shame over his own sexuality. Up until the time of Augustine, many of the Greek fathers, like Origen of Alexandria, seemed to believe that the garden story is clearly atemporal. That is not simply located in one moment of space and, and time. And that makes a lot of sense when you consider that Adam's name, the man's name is man. And that the garden is on the holy mountain, according to Ezekiel, which means, gosh, the holy mountain moves around in Scripture. Before Origen, Irenaeus taught that Adam had the mind of a child. And that's why he took the fruit. And he was abundantly aware that Adam was somehow all of us. Get this, Irenaeus was discipled by Polycarp. And Polycarp was discipled by John, the apostle. Origen lived about 70 years later, and he was tortured horrifically for his faith. And so he was hardly some sort of wishy-washy liberal that just, you know, wanted to make the Bible say whatever he wanted it to say. However, Augustine, he formulated his doctrine at the start of the 5th century under the oversight of the Roman Empire and using a bad translation. Romans 5.12, Paul writes this. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Because all sinned. Augustine used a translation that read, because in him, in Adam, all sinned. And Paul does say that, we talked about this verse last week, that in Adam all, all died, all died in Adam, but that doesn't mean that because one particular guy living thousands of years ago named Adam because he sinned, we have all inherited the guilt of that man. Augustine went on to describe original sin as taking the fruit from the tree, but then he described spreading the guilt as having sex. Which is really weird when you consider the very first commandment in the Bible is be fruitful and multiply, which implies, I don't know, at least a little sex. 
But according to Augustine, Adam in his pre-fallen state could obtain erections without physical desire. But after the fall, he could only get them through immoral desire. And so all babies were born with guilt and they go to hell unless baptized by the Church of Rome, of which, of course, Augustine was a bishop. During the Reformation, Calvin tried to correct Augustine by arguing that all babies, well, actually were born with sin and uh, born with guilt and cursed by God and would all go to hell unless they had faith in grace, which means trust in the relentless love of God our Father. (laughs) Well, that's a little conflicted, right? And it puts an awful lot of weight on one ancient man who's obviously entirely ignorant. That's the point of the story. He doesn't have the knowledge of good and evil until he takes the knowledge of good and evil and then suddenly knows that he just did evil. And so you see, this doctrine makes God the Father look pretty mean. And most people seem to even think that God the Father killed God the Son because he was so angry and disappointed with this guy named Adam. I love this uh, meme. Jesus is there talking to Adam and Eve in the garden, and he says, I know this sounds crazy, but if you guys eat the fruit of that knowledge tree, my dad's going to effing kill me. That's just vulgar, isn't it? That's why you're struggling with, do I laugh? Do I not laugh? That's just vulgar. And yet, isn't that what we have believed? Maybe we need to ask, what was the fruit on that knowledge tree? That tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what was Adam's sin? Julian of Norwich. Amazing. She asked Jesus in in her vision, supposedly. She she said she asked him, and she was real nervous about this question, but she asked him, why didn't you prevent sin? And she claims that she heard him answer, sin is befitting, it's necessary, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And then she writes, but I did not see sin, for I believe it has no sort of substance nor portion of being, nor could it be recognized were it not for the suffering it causes. She's saying that sin is the absence of something, the absence of of being, like a shadow is the absence of light, like um, a lie is the absence of truth, like I am not is the absence of I am that I am. Paul uses the Greek word hamartia in Romans 5, which we normally translate as sin. Ha is a negative prefix in Greek, like ah is a negative prefix in in English. So a person that's amoral or amoral is a person without morals. Martia comes from meros, which means part or portion. So sin is like a missing part, uh, a missing portion. Paul writes, death spread to all men because all men sinned. Now, sin is a noun and a a verb, right? So you can have sin, but when you act on it or out of it, it it becomes a verb and you become a, a sinner. Next line in Romans 5, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted. It's not imputed where there is no law. And, and what is law? Well, isn't it a type of knowledge? A type of knowledge of good and evil. Dead knowledge. It's like written in stone or in a book. In Romans 7, Paul writes this, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Commentators just go nuts with this question, when was Paul alive and when did he die? You see, maybe he was talking about when he was a little child. Elizabeth was alive, but there was something in Elizabeth that was missing, and that's knowledge of good and evil. 
We didn't blame Elizabeth. But we also knew that she would need to learn. There was also something in John that was missing, and yet he was just beginning to know. You can see it in his eyes. Something's missing. And so he was just beginning to feel blame and just beginning to hide. John knew, and yet he didn't know as he ought to know or as he would know. So what was missing in John and Elizabeth? Faith in dad and the word of dad that it was good. You know, we're each born trusting, but we don't know whom to trust. I got a video of a little kid playing with a snake. Most amazing video to me. Do I trust the snake? Do I trust dad? And what was Adam missing in the garden before the fall? Faith in God and the word of God. That's the logic of logos of theos, the logos of, of love, that it, that it was good. And that's sin. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin, writes Paul. So can we blame Adam? Because don't we need to blame someone? Can we blame Adam? Well, no. Just like any little kid, he didn't have the knowledge of good and evil. And did he need to know the good? Well, yeah, because that's God's judgment. Let us make Adam in our own image and likeness, and God is good. Before the fall, God looked at Adam and said, it's not good that the Adam is alone. And yet, Adam was in the presence of love. God is love, who is Adam's helper. You see, Adam didn't know love. He didn't have faith and love in love, and, and that's not good. That's the part of Adam that is missing, faith and love, his father. And so what was that hanging on the weird knowledge tree in the garden? I think it was the faithful one, the son of God, who trusts his father. It was who it is that each of us are supposed to be, and yet we cannot make ourselves become. The eschatos Adam. The last Adam. The finished Adam. John and Elizabeth wanted to make themselves like me and Susan. But even more, Susan and I wanted to make John and Elizabeth like ourselves. Time and time again, they broke the rules trying to do just that. And time and time again, we forgave them for just that. And now, we don't need any rules. It's how we shape them in our image. And why we decide to have them in the first place. Listen closely. If we try to make ourselves God, it's sin and death. But if God makes us himself... It's grace and life. And maybe both of those things can be happening in exactly the same moment. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by all the sons and daughters of, of Adam, he said something rather fascinating to his disciples at supper. John 15, 21, they, the Jews, don't know him, the Father, who sent me, the word of the Father. And then he said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Literally, the sin of them. That's the sin of Adam. In the morning, at the sixth hour of the day, sixth day of the week, and sixth day of creation, we would all take the life of the good on a tree in a garden on the holy mountain. And we would all take the life, uh, we would all take the life of the good and the word of God who is the good would give his life to us. <laughs> we would take his life and he would give his life saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do and it is finished. God did not kill Jesus on a tree because we took the fruit of knowledge. We killed Jesus on a tree because he is the fruit that we took. 
And according to the revelation, this happened from the foundation of the world. Genesis speaks of two trees that look just the same in one place, or perhaps one tree that functions in two ways depending on how you take it. Uh, on the tree is the good in flesh. And Jesus said God alone is good, and Jesus is God in flesh. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And on the tree is life. And Jesus said, I am the life. And Jesus said, this is eternal life. Knowing, so knowing's not necessary. Knowing is not necessary. But this is eternal life. Knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. This is eternal life. Knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. It's the tree of life. Don't you want to, to know him? It fascinates me that comedians and artists can see this picture. This one was painted by Giovanni de Modena, who was commissioned to paint some horrific pictures of hell in the 15th century. You've seen those. I'm, I'm not sure why he painted this one 10 years later, but I'd like to think that he desperately longed to see Jesus. And I think he did. He saw what modern theologians have such a hard time seeing. He saw the good. He saw the life. He saw beauty and truth. He saw the word of God hanging on one tree in the garden of the human soul. It's as if, it's as if insisting on knowing something in one way can keep you from knowing that thing or that person in another way. So artists and comedians can see what so many theologians can't see. You know, a biologist uh, can dissect a frog and come to know all about frogs, dead frogs. But if you really want to know a frog, you need to know that frog like a child who keeps that frog as a pet. A psychiatrist, a psychiatrist can know all about women and never allow himself to be known by a woman. And so never actually know a woman. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with all these ethical issues and divisions in the Corinthian church. If you've read Corinthians, you know that. But he just pauses at one point and writes the following. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge, what, what kind of knowledge? The knowledge that we possess. This knowledge puffs up. It's how each one of us builds a false self, right? This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he's known by God. You see, there are two ways of knowing, and there are at least two things that can be known. There is one way to know about things in space and time. Remember, that's the things on the timeline that we looked at. You, you seize control of them, you test them, and thereby you comprehend them. We normally call this science, and it's great because its application is technology. So there's one way to know about things in space and time, but there's another way to know about things from beyond the timeline. You cannot seize control of them and put them to the test. You must surrender control to them and be tested by them and comprehended by them. In, in other words, you must be known in order to know. It's called faith. And faith means trust. And if you trust someone, well, then you can just ask them and they'll tell you about themselves. You don't have to dissect them. You can talk to them. Trust is eye contact. And now I'm talking about last week's sermon. First person, personal pronoun, I. It's eye contact, the I that's hidden in the me. So Adam, how will you know God? How will you know the fruit on the tree? And now my children, you see, really were the very, 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 very best clinical pastoral experience for me. It was amazing to watch. By the age of five and definitely once they had gone to school, they had become like addicted to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What I'm saying is they became legalists. 
They were not very proficient, so it was easy to laugh at their judgments, but they began judging everything based on what we had told them. What words good were good, what words... I mean, friends were coming over, their kids were like, that's a bad word, that's a good word. Oh, you know, what things uh, were, were allo- you were allowed to do, what things you were not allowed to do, and so who deserved blessing and who deserved cursing? That is, who was to blame? It was a big deal. Those are also some of my very first memories. When I was five, I went um, ice skating with my friend Ray Hayes and, and his family. I remember Ray fell and his mom said, Ray, you fell on your butt. And then she laughed. And immediately I thought, she's going to hell. <laughs> I thought that because my mom had told me, we don't say butt. That's a bad word. I think it was the last time that I did anything with Ray's family. I judged them out of my life. Or maybe I judged the life out of my own. Exiled myself from my own garden. My children became addicted to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, began judging everything, and perhaps worst of all, they began judging themselves. You understand? This knowledge puffs up. It's how we build that false self. It's how we hide in fig leaves and ego. It's how we blame others. And in the end, hide from love. It's how Adam breaks into 8.2 billion separate and very lonely people. And as you know, it's not good that the Adam should be alone. That's why my children begin to hide their hearts from me. It's why each of us is still hiding our hearts from God our Father. We know about the good. We know the descriptions of the good. The good says this word, the good doesn't say that word, the good does these things, the good doesn't do that things. We know about the good, but we won't be known by the good. We hide. I think it's why God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. It was an intervention. They knew the good, but they were knowing him in the wrong way. They thought love was a law to be written in stone, and so they could no longer see that love is the life that had been with them all along. He kicked them out of the garden. And yet he went with them in the sanctuary of their own soul. Because you know, whatever he does to the least of these, he does to himself. And when we trust it, when we trust it, 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 when we trust it, it's actually him trusting for us and with us in the garden of our souls. It's the life of love in us calling us home to him. When we love, we are known by love. And we know as we ought to know. We didn't kick our children out of the garden. But maybe they did. Just like we all do. And so I've had to wait. But as I said, the greatest moments of my life have been those moments when they've come back and I think, there you are. And here I am. The good's not a law. The good is love. And when we love, we fulfill the law. When we love, it's because our false self has been flooded with the grace of God, and so we become what we always wanted to be, and that's the image and likeness of God our Father, our Heavenly Father, who is love. We love because He first loved us. And when he loves us, when and where we have not loved him, we come to know that he has and will always be loving us first. He's the uncaused cause. We return home to him and know the place for the first time. So Adam, how will you know God? I could ask the question this way, okay? Bride of Christ, how will you know that man hanging on the tree? Because I think he's your husband. In Genesis 2, God has Adam name all the animals. That's science. He learns about reproduction, and yet he's still alone and can't find his helper who is with him. So God puts Adam to sleep and makes him male and female. And then the snake makes a suggestion. Take and eat and make yourself in the image of God. It's the first conversation in the Bible about God in the third person, spoken as if he's not there. But I think he is there. He's the fruit hanging on the tree. So, Bride of Christ, you could take knowledge and use that knowledge 
You could try to know him as a, as a thing, but you would crucify the life and everything would die. Or, bride of Christ, you could surrender to him, be known by him the life, and give birth to life, which is a communion of love. He who loves is known by God. I could ask the question this way. Child of God, how will you know that man hanging on the tree? He's from the bosom of the Father. I think that's your Father's heart. Sigmund Freud argued that religion is the memory of the primal deed. When the sons of the Father grew jealous of the Father and so murdered that Father to obtain all of his women and all of his things, and then they missed the Father. Sigmund Freud was not entirely wrong. So, children of God, how will you know your father? You could take knowledge of the good, but then you'd crucify the good, kill the life, and know the evil. You would know what? That you're alone. And that's not good. And isn't that what we did on the holy mountain? Isn't that what we do whenever we take knowledge of the good in order to make ourselves in the image of God so we can be God and not need God? You know, the CIA knows all about me. They're worried about me because Susan's dad worked with Lockheed Martin on weapons systems. But, but the CIA does not know me. They do not know me like the little boy and the little girl in that picture. The CIA means nothing to me. And they mean everything to me. I could ask the question this way. My dear atheist friends, how will you know the uncaused cause? Because I think he's the man on the tree in this picture. In high school, I really got into Josh McDowell, you know, and evidence demands a verdict and the idea that I could prove the existence of God. And then years later, I read this from Karl Barth. Note well, in the whole Bible, not the slightest attempt is ever made to prove God. See, it's almost as if knowing him in one way keeps you from knowing him in the other way and I hope that you know that he goes by different names, names like truth and wisdom and beauty and goodness and life and, and love. What did you think that is, a hormone? If I must know God as a thing, how could I be known by him as a person? In high school, I, I dropped my knees sobbing one night as I cried out, God, I don't think I can believe in you anymore didn't even occur to me that I was speaking to the one I said I didn't believe in. That I thought didn't exist. You know, in all my years as a father, I never ever once concerned myself with whether or not my kids would believe that I existed. But I constantly concerned myself with this question. Do they want me to exist? And by me, I mean me, the I, deep down inside of me. Do they want me to exist so that we could exist together in one world and be happy? People will ask sometimes, Peter, why do you believe in God? And I've thought about that a lot. And I got to tell you, at this point in my life, I have a busload of empirical evidence. But, but the reason I prayed to God when I told him that I didn't believe that he existed was something else entirely. It was eye contact. E-Y-E. -E, and I, first person, personal pronoun, contact. Spirit to spirit, like we talked about last. It was the I in me seeing the I in another. In third grade, I think it might have been fourth grade. Third or fourth grade, I was an uncoordinated, chunky pastor's kid. I was an uncoordinated, chunky pastor's kid in both grades who tried incredibly hard to be accepted but couldn't accept myself. And then at one point, I think it was third grade, I developed um, knee problems. My knees would literally just lock up, sometimes one, sometimes another, for about a week at a, at a time. And if someone forced them to bend, like one of the doctors who thought I was just making it up, if, he for, if someone, I would just scream in absolute 
pain, agony. They did exploratory surgery. So when I'm wearing shorts sometime, you can still see this big scar across my left knee. They literally took my knee apart, scraped out all this stuff that was growing in my knee that they still don't know what it, what it was to this day. And then they sewed my knee back together and informed my parents that I would probably be a cripple by the time I graduated from high school. In the hospital after the surgery, my left leg would like go into spasms. And in all my life, I mean, I had never experienced pain like that before or since. I would make everyone in the room sit absolutely still while the spasm was happening, just so I could focus on getting through. And I couldn't get, I could barely get through. And my dad, I remember he would sit there by the side of the bed and he would just gaze at me. And then when the spasm was over, his eyes would like burrow into mine. He would say, oh, Peter, if there was any way that I could, I would. I would take your pain from you and i give it to me. And I so clearly remember looking back at him and thinking, what the hell is wrong with you? (laughs) No one in their right mind, no one in this entire world would ever wish this pain upon themselves. And yet I believe he actually wanted my pain. And then I knew there was something or someone in my dad from another world. I knew the uncaused cause. I knew love because love knew me. I don't think I would have seen him without the pain. My outer man, my false self had been stripped away and dad was gazing at who it is that I am. And my pain was my father's pain. His outer man was stripped away, and I was gazing at him. I am that I am, suffering for me and with me and in me. Faith in you is Jesus in you, knowing you so that you would know him and his father, our father. And there are some things you just can't learn in a book. And so God subjected creation to futility. God consigned all men to disobedience. He created Adam ignorant of love. And then allowed Adam to take his life on a tree. So Adam would see that he had always given his life on that tree. So that Adam could know as he ought to know so that Adam could experience relentless love, and so trusting love, he could begin to freely love as he ought to love, not because it's a law and a book, but it's because it's the only desire in his heart, so that Adam could enjoy his father's banquet forever without end, for it is the end, the beginning and the end, and the plot to every story. All the kids were home at Christmas this year, and... uh, Jonathan seemed entirely comfortable with the indoor plumbing. Elizabeth, as far as I know, didn't try to eat Susan's makeup. And you need to understand this story is not over, still being written. But when they came home at Christmas, we had no rules. They all have master's degrees, doctorate degrees. They're not stupid. But in all honesty, I really don't give a turd about what they know. I'm just so happy that they wanted to be home (laughs) with with me and who I am. And now if you're thinking to yourself, oh gosh, I, I wish I had a dad like Peter's dad. You need to know that my dad's dad was an alcoholic who once threatened to kill all of his children right there in front of my dad, standing, watching him as he waved a rifle around the room and my grandma hung on to the stock of the rifle. Every earthly dad is only a faint reflection of the dad who is the good and the life. So if you think, I wish I had a good dad, the entire point of this entire sermon is you do. 
for on the night that he was betrayed. You know, Paul said uh, uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was in Christ. So on the night our father was betrayed by every one of us, he took bread and broke it saying, this is my body given to you. Do this and remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. The life is in the blood. Uh, the spirit is in the blood. This is eye contact. Five weeks ago, um, after the service, Marisa Kruger um, came up to me at the picnic on the patio, came up to all of us. I think Marisa's watching downstairs, so hey, Marisa, but I'm going to talk about you for a minute. Marisa's an, an eye doctor, E-Y-E, and I think also an I, first person pronoun, doctor. Five weeks ago, she came up after the sermon, she said, I, I need to tell you something. Five weeks ago, I preached on laughter and had to share about the finances at the church, and I'm telling you, I really felt naked, and I didn't know which way to go, and Marisa came up afterwards and she told me that she had had a vision of a naked man kneeling here in the sanctuary, right there over there in, in that aisle, as if praying for us, which us would include me. Two weeks later, three weeks ago, Marisa saw him again. She said, because we've been praying, she said, yeah, it was Jesus. And with tears in her eyes, she said, Peter, he stood in the aisle with his hands outstretched and he just gazed at everyone in the room with such love and such, I, she, was, she was weeping. She said, I don't even know how to describe it. But then she said this, this was the weird thing. It was like he had the ability to make eye contact with everyone in the room in the exact same moment. I think that's the moment eternity touches time. I still don't know what exactly to do about buildings and finances. But I know that Jesus knows how I feel and that he's with us. And maybe that's really all that I need to know. Him. Dark cups are wine, light cups are juice. And they are both the love of your father. And so, Dad, we like you because you have always liked us. And we thank you that you are who you are and for showing us who you are in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so what did we learn? Original sin is original ignorance of love. You fell so that God could teach you to walk by faith in love. If you think you know something, you don't yet know as you ought to know. For love is not a thing in this world. God is love. God disciplines us because we sin. But we sin because God created us ignorant of love so that we could be known by love, learn to trust love, and so become love like him. There's no one to blame and everyone to love. And if you want all of it wrapped up in a nutshell, it's Romans 11:32. God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And mercy is his judgment, and his judgment doesn't change. So, Sasha, could you put up that picture one more time? I was thinking about this today. Y you know, in order to get this shot, I had to have, like, peeked around the door and then went and got the camera. This is before the days of cell phones, you know. And I snuck back around and surprised them. And you'll see Elizabeth's clueless. She's like, hey, Daddy. And, and John's thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> and... Uh, this is my favorite picture of my kids because, you see, I see myself in them. <laughs> and I also discover God in myself. 
because that feeling doesn't come from me. It comes from somewhere else. And you might be a little more like Elizabeth, like, hey, Daddy, I don't know what's going on. Or you might be like John, and you're thinking, oh, I have made a royal mess of things, and I wonder how it feels about me now. I turned some people to dust, perhaps. Maybe you turned someone into dust. Maybe you did horrific things to someone. But you don't know how powerful your daddy is. He breathes into the dust. He makes all things new. And this is what you need to know. His judgment of you doesn't change. I knew this day would come. And a whole lot of other days that are way more messy. But I'd already made up my mind. It was the day I said to Susan, yeah, you can put away the birth control. <laughs> I'm just saying that's how God feels about you. And you need to know it. So in Jesus' name, don't just believe the gospel like it's some kind of formula in a book. Believe the gospel because he's a person that adores you. In his name, amen.